nine months. Nine months. Do you realize we've been doing this for nine months now? And, and, and here it is, it's almost Christmas. Um, who thought we'd be doing this at Christmas time? Nine months of, of social distancing. Nine months of wearing a mask. Nine months of hoarding toilet paper. I, I don't know about you, but these nine months have been the longest decade of my life. I'm ready for this to be over. I'm ready for a break. Are, are you ready? Are you ready for this to be done? Are you ready to have that, that, that sense of comfort again that you can leave your home? That you can, you can leave your home to go to school, to go to, to go to work, to come to church without feeling like you have to put a hazmat on and wash your hands every 20 seconds. Are, are, are you ready for things to get back to normal? And I want to ask a question. Does it feel like it's just too dangerous to hope that things will change? Because if that's you, if you're sensing that, that this is just a, a hard time to hope because things keep changing, then I want to say that you're in the right place. I want you to take that feeling and I want you to just hold on to it for just a minute because then I want you to, to multiply that by a hundred. And then you'll just start to be, start to feel what the, the Israelite people, the Hebrew people would have been feeling at the time of Jesus' birth. The time that we're celebrating here at Christmas. They were feeling a, a sense of, of how long, God? Of why is this taking so long? Because it hadn't just been nine months, it had been years. It had been 400 years. In fact, they had been in a place of, of social distancing. They've been in a place of, of, of asking the question, God, where are you ever since their distance learning opportunity that we studied in the book of Daniel? So they hadn't heard from God for 400 years. They might have thought that God had forgotten about them. And this is the place that they find themselves. This is where God's people find themselves in a very similar place to us. But just at that moment is when Simeon enters the scene. Luke verse tw two, chapter two, verse 25 says this, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Now, Luke doesn't tell us much about Simeon. He doesn't really tell us what he does. Uh, he, he doesn't seem like he's got any official capacity at the, the temple, but he's there. It's not like he's a, a priest or a prophet or anything like that. But it does say something pretty important about him. It tells us three important things about Simeon. It says this, that in verse 25, he says that this, is, this man was righteous and devout. And then he says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, before I move on any further, I just got to point out that, that God uses righteous, devout people that are filled by his Holy Spirit. That's what we need more of. We, we need a church of people that are righteous, of, of women and men who are righteous and devout and filled by the Holy Spirit. Those people can change the world. And so this is a pretty important resume that he has. The accolades that Luke says about him is, is pretty amazing. But there's one thing that he's doing there in the temple. It says this, that he was righteous, he was devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, this phrase is an important one, waiting for the consolation of of Israel. See, the consolation or, or comfort of is Israel is what he was waiting for. And that kind of became a term that, that referred to the, all the promises that, that Yahweh had given to his people over the centuries. All of the, the ways that God was going to restore Israel to its rightful place. All the ways that God had promised that he would come. And the word that uh, is used for waiting is the word prosdecami. And, and, and this is the word that would have been used for someone who stood outside of the door waiting to invite a guest into their home. 
Okay, so not just someone who's just sitting around waiting. This is someone who is out and looking and saying, where are they? And that's exactly what Simeon was all about. Simeon was waiting to usher in a very special guest. Verse 26 tells us it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So, so Simeon was waiting to invite the Savior in. He knew the promises. He knew that the Savior would be the answer to Israel's problems. He knew that this Savior would provide comfort and consolation. So he waited. But as we're going to see, this was not just a passive waiting. This was an active waiting. It's not like uh, Simeon was just sitting at home on Netflix waiting, kind of the way that we've been waiting for this to be over for all of these months. That's not what Simeon was doing. He was active. He was looking and watching because not only did he have this deep desire to see change happen, but he had a confident expectation that God would that actually led him to do something about it. And so as we're going to see, Simeon is a real example to us. The best way that I can sum up what Simeon models for us is the virtue of, of hope. You see, Simeon was a man of hope. He had a great hope in the Lord, and I think that's what we need today. But what we're going to see is it's not a passive hope. It was active, and it took courage for Simeon to hope. And that's what I want to challenge us with today. In fact, I want to invite you to, to write this down, that our goal today is to develop the courage to hope. Because hope takes courage. And so do you have the courage to hope? And I mean today. I mean courage to hope for now, for today, even in all the chaos of our world. Do you have the courage to hope? Uh, part of this is an invitation I want to invite you to allow yourself to hope again, because we've, we grew up hoping. Hope was a part of what all kids experience in life, and now is a time when we need hope all the more. But hope is hard, especially for people who've been burned before. And I just have this sense that, that we're all in this state of, of being hurt by this. We've all been burned by this, and so we all need hope. So if you're out there and you're, you're just feeling like, feeling like things are a little tense, like maybe you're just a little more edgy than you used to be. Uh, maybe you, you're just you know, a little too quick to get angry and to get mad at your kids or whatever that is. This that, that's because we're in this tense, chaotic times. Uh, what I want to tell you is that hope is what you need. That, in fact, the, if you're in that place right now and, and you relate to that, that you are actually primed for hope because you are waiting for something better. But, but hope is one of those things that we don't talk about a whole lot. <laughs> Uh, I mean, at least not in comparison to some of the other things that are talked about in the same category in our Bible. For instance, um, this is one of what has been called uh, one of the theological virtues, okay? There's three of them, and, and Paul lists them in 1 Corinthians 13. He says this, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love, he says. Now, and of course, we know that the greatest of these is love, all right? We, we get that, and we also, we, we talk about faith a lot. Faith is, is in our name, right? We are Emmanuel Faith Community Church, right? So we, we, we get that those are important, but we don't give, give hope quite the attention that I think it deserves. Because I think hope is, is incredibly important, especially today. In fact, uh, I, 
I think hope is what all people need. Hope is the virtue for those who wait. And if you're waiting for something better right now, then that is the virtue for you. You see, just like the the prophets of old, they waited. They were waiting on Jesus. And so Simeon was waiting. And if you think about it, the the disciples, um, after they had met Jesus, most of their time, they just spent waiting for Jesus to do more. And then as soon as he told them that he was going to leave, they asked him, when are you coming back? As if they couldn't wait any longer for him to return. And, And we've been waiting ever since. But now we're waiting for him to return. So to be human is to to wait, at least on this side of eternity. If you think about it, uh, hope is one of those things that we're not going to need in heaven. See, in heaven, we're going to have all that we've ever wanted. And so we're not going to need to hope for it. We won't need to wait for it like we do now. And so that tells me that hope is a distinctly, uh, distinct, distinctly human virtue on this side of eternity. And we need to develop it. And since that's where we stand, let's spend some time learning what we can about hope from Simeon. I want to read this passage, uh, the rest of our passage today, starting in verse 27. It says this, and he came in the spirit into the temple. And when, when the parents brought the child Jesus to him, um, according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. I want to suggest that Simeon teaches us a bunch about hope. There's three things about hope in general, and then three about the biblical virtue of hope. To begin with, let's start with the the three about hope in general. Often people talk about hope as if it's just some sort of anticipation. Uh, Oh, I I hope that one day we can stop wearing a mask, (laughs) right? That kind of thing. But I also got to point out though, it's got to be more than just anticipation because you can anticipate something bad happening. That's called fear. And so hope has in it a desire for something good. And that's the first thing that I want you to see is that hope desires. See, it begins with just a simple desire, but real hope is often an abiding desire. It's more, it's a strong desire. Notice how much this was a desire for Simeon. Simeon, he had based his life around this. So much so that when this word from the Lord was fulfilled, it's as if he says, "Ha! Ah, I can finally die a happy man. He, he's saying my life's purpose has been fulfilled now. But I also hear this sense of relief in his words. As if to say, I've been, I've been coming here day in and day out. I, I finally don't have to keep working anymore. See, this for Simeon was a, a, an abiding desire, a long-term desire. Truth is that hope desires. And, and it remained with him until it was fulfilled. And he continued to act on it which tells me that his desire took the next step from just being something that he desires into something more like hope. And that's because hope expects. You see, uh, Simeon expected God to actually act on what had been promised. And a reasonable expectation is necessary for hope. You see, uh, I can have an abiding desire to win the lottery, which I do. (laughs) Uh, But it's, it's not hope 
Um, it, it's actually more like just wishful thinking, uh, especially since there's this problem that uh, my math teachers, thank you math teachers, told me how you know, unreasonable it is to actually win the lottery, and so I don't actually go out and purchase tickets. Now, I still want to win, uh, but I'm not doing any, anything about it, and so I have no expectation to win the lottery. And so, hope must have an expectation. Hope expects. But at this point, I want you to notice how confident Simeon was in this. <laughs> Simeon not only expected, he had a confident expectation. Because I, I don't know, I don't care like, you know, where you've lived or, or, or what era it was in throughout history. It has always been awkward to walk up to a woman uh, holding her child, take that child and then prophesy over that child. Okay. It's always just kind of been a weird thing to do. Um, and, and Simeon does this. This is exactly what he does. He just walks up to her and, and he is confident that this is the child. Sure enough, he was right. Simeon had a confident expectation that God would act. And because Simeon was confident of God's action, he was, his confidence led him to act himself. And, and that's what hope does to you. It, it, it moves you. You see, it's just wishful thinking if it doesn't move you towards action. I love a great book by Bob Goff. It's hilarious and heartwarming, and it's simply called Love Does. And the title itself makes the point that, that love is an action. And what I want to tell you is the next point is that hope does. Okay? Uh, hope also does, right? Hope does. Uh, hope is not idle. It is active. And so what we see so far is that, that hope desires, hope expects, and hope does. Now, I, I think those three, those three parts of hope can, can apply to any, any type of hope, any hope in anything. But Simeon also teaches us three things about the, the biblical value, the, the theological virtue of hope. He teaches us that there's more to it. There's more to it. See, if, if it's going to move you, um, if it's going to move you, it's going to take more. And so what we see is that much of, of, of Simeon's confidence came from the fact that verse 25 tells us that the Holy Spirit was upon him. In fact, we're told three times in three verses that the Holy Spirit was involved in Simeon's, Simeon's life. Um, the Spirit was upon him. The Spirit revealed the truth to him. And then this interesting phrase that in verse 27, that he came in the Spirit to the temple. See, what biblical hope is different in that biblical hope is empowered by spirit-led effort. Okay, that's what I want you to write down. That biblical hope is empowered by spirit-led effort. He came in the spirit to the temple. Now, that doesn't mean that Simeon was somehow possessed by the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, it, it wasn't like, like God had taken away uh, Simeon's freedom, because God doesn't do that, right? Instead, I can just picture Simeon waking up that morning and just as he's praying, sensing God saying, sensing the Spirit say to him, you need to go to the, to the temple. And so, he listened. He had the courage to listen to what the Spirit was saying to him. And then once he got there, I could just see him looking around, just sensing, God, what do you want from me here? And as soon as he saw that couple with that baby, that's when he moved. It was Spirit-led effort. This is what Spirit-led effort looks like. It's a response to the Spirit's often subtle leading. And, and see, hope, hope has the courage to follow that leading. But the Spirit is, is always leading us towards God's purposes, not our own. And so uh, hope is not about us. Uh, since God's purposes have always been about bringing salvation and his restoration to all who would receive it through God's Messiah, 
we can sum up what hope is by saying that biblical hope seeks the kingdom reign of Jesus. Okay, so you can write that down, that, that, that hope seeks the kingdom reign of Jesus. Not just in myself, but for everyone. Notice how expansive Simeon's words are here. Uh, he uses words like all peoples in verse 31. And then he claims that this baby in verse 32 uh, will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles for the glory to your people. Now, up until this point, uh, Mary and Joseph had not heard, the, not realized the scope of what Jesus was there for. They knew that he was Messiah. They knew he was special, but they hadn't heard this. And this is why they marveled at what they had heard. It included even the Gentiles. To them, that is huge. And, and that's my final observation here uh, that, that he teaches us about biblical hope. And that is that biblical hope will always expand your horizons. Have you ever sat at the beach and, and looked out at the horizon, right? That the furthest you can see, and it just seems like the ocean goes forever. Well, well, it doesn't. In fact, uh, when you're at sea level, all you can see with your eyes is just over three miles. That's because the earth curves after that, and you can't see anymore unless it's real high or unless you get up real high. And see, from where I am now, I can see for miles and miles. But at the ocean, you see three miles. Now, if your horizon is just what it is at the ocean, then you see a very small fraction of the earth. If you were to see a three mile uh, radius all the way around you, then you would only be seeing zero point zero 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 one percent of the world. All that to say is that you'd be seeing a very small part of the world. And what God does through hope, what, what he wants and what he's always leading us to do is to expand our vision of the world. It, what, it, what, what hope does is it lifts us up so that we can see more. We can see what God is doing because the fact of the matter is that there is no person who is lost beyond hope. There, there are no systems so entrenched and so dark that light cannot pierce it and enter in. There is still hope. Do you have the courage to hope? So if I could put all of those together into one definition, what I'd say about hope is this, that, that biblical hope is an abiding desire with, with confident expectation and spirit-led effort in order to see the kingdom of Jesus be a blessing to the world. Okay, you get that abiding, abiding uh, desire, confident expectation, spirit-led effort. This is what it's all about. And I really like this definition. But the question is, why don't we live it? Because uh, as I think about it, it, it just strikes me that Christians aren't known for being hopeful. In fact, to be honest, it just seems like a lot of Christians are known for being quite the opposite, that we don't actually live hope and we're often the ones with the least amount of hope. The Apostle Peter has a, a term that he uses that I love that I think really fits uh, Simeon's life. And, and he says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, he calls, he says that it's a living hope. What, what he's saying is that, that hope affects every aspect of our life. For Peter, it, it's a hope that can get you through any kind of trial. And that's what we need. Um, but it's not only hope that can get you through trials, it, it's a hope that you can, allows you to continue to seek God's kingdom even in the midst of them, even when you're being persecuted, even in difficult times like this. Peter's challenge to us uh, is a powerful one um, to, to have a living hope. And he explains it a little bit more in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. He tells us is this, uh, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, 
Okay? Even if you're suffering, even if you're in this, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But, he says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. But, but did you get that part? What, what, what Peter assumes is going to happen in Christians. He assumes that Christians are going to be so hope-filled that there's going to be hope just oozing out of them so much that there's going to be all of these non-Christians walking around looking at them, at them confused saying, why do you have so much hope? Hey, hey, what's wrong with you, Christian? You shouldn't have that kind of hope. You, you shouldn't be living in a world like this and experience hope. That's just not normal. That's what he expected. That's the way we should live. That hope becomes a problem. You know, uh, interestingly, there's a, there's a problem, kind of a philosophical problem that, that a lot of people want to talk about. Uh, it's called the, the problem of evil, right? And, and the, really, it just states this. How can God exist in the midst of so much evil? There's evil in the world. How can God exist? Now, this is what Peter wanted for us. He wanted us to live our lives so that we become a problem of hope. The question would be, how can God exist, or how can, how can Christians have hope in the midst of all that evil? I think it's a good problem to have. You see, Peter's point is that hope is not natural. There's, there's no reason why you should be hopeful in the midst of all this chaos especially in our world now, right? Uh, with all the, the political chaos, all the pandemic chaos, there's no good reason why you should have hope. The natural thing for humans to do is to abandon all hope and to just give up. But Peter knows something about hope, uh, especially about biblical hope. He knows it's not natural because hope is supernatural. And that's why, that's why we have a hope, because it doesn't, it's not about us, and it comes from God. What Peter is challenging us to do is to develop the courage to have supernatural hope. He's saying that we should be the most hopeful people in the world, uh, not just because, and this is key here, not just because one day down the road, we're going to leave this chaos and this mess and, and, and go to a better place. All right. Okay. Now that, that's a, that's a good hope. Okay. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not the only reason why we should have hope. If that's the, the only reason why you have hope today is because one day in the future, uh, most likely after you've died, that then things will be okay. Then I just want to tell you that that's just that's not the kind of hope that the Bible talks about. And it's just too little. It's, it's not enough. First reason it's not enough is it's like telling somebody that they, once again, they won the lottery, but they can only have the money when they're dead. You think to yourself, well, I'd take it, I guess, but it doesn't do me any good. And the second reason that it's just not enough, it is just not the way that the Bible talks about hope. Instead, biblical hope is, is hope for today. It is hope for now. It's hope for the world. And it's hope that actually makes a difference here and now. One of my heroes, C.S. Lewis, in his, his magnum opus, uh, Mere Christianity, right? His just amazing book. He has a chapter on hope, okay? Small chapter. And he says something powerful in that chapter. He says this, It, being hope, uh, does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, he says, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world are just those who thought most about the next. He goes on to say that the apostles themselves who set foot on conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished, abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. He says this, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. 
what he's telling us to do, it, it, what he's telling us is that what hope does is it aims at heaven. It aims at more. And so the question becomes, how do we aim at heaven? What does that look like for us? And, and let me just tell you simply, it, it looks exactly like Jesus' prayer, right? I mean, you know the Lord's prayer. He, he prays, um, our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then he says these words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth here as it is in heaven, right? We're aiming to make this place look more like heaven. We're looking to heaven. We're looking to God to say, what does that look like? Okay, what do I need to do? That's why we're reading this book. We're trying to figure out and then we're trying to bring it here. That is what it looks like to aim at heaven. So our invitation to people is that this whole thing, that that salvation is, it really is like winning the lottery, except except it's not just for you, that that you actually get to take that and then give it away. That the good news is is that we get to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We get to be a part of blessing the world. That is God's kingdom work. And so what I want to tell you to do is to aim at the kingdom. Because when we aim at the kingdom, it is all thrown in. So our hope is not about something that will happen one day in the future. It's actually about something that happened one day in the past. You see, Jesus changed the world so that today we can join with him by being one of God's agents that bring heaven near. I think this is such a cool way to look at it, that that hope isn't just for going to heaven one day, which is a great thing. It's just that that's too small because it's just about you. Hope is about more. It's about bringing heaven here. And so... uh, This takes courage though. It it takes courage to hope like that because it's hoping for others, it's hoping for the world. And so I wanna invite you to let yourself hope again, but this time, not just for you. Let's have the courage to hope for our city. Let's hope for our world. Uh, Let's have real hope that's so much bigger than us. That's That's what Simeon did. He hoped for more. He hoped for something bigger than himself, and and, and that's what we're being invited into. You see, there's a lost and dying world out there that needs hope, and and we get to be a part of the solution. Now, that's a big thing. I mean, hope is huge, and and some people will tell you not to hope because, uh, you know, you could be disappointed or that it's unrealistic and things like that. Um, I want to tell you that it takes courage to hope. And yet this is why there's a thrill of hope. That hope is exciting because we get to be a part of what God is doing in our world. And and it isn't with our own strength or our own power. The truth is that you can't change the world on your own. Only God can. And this is maybe why this is the most important thing of of all. And that is that uh, there's no point in hoping in anything. That biblical hope is, is actually in no thing <laughs> because it's in a person. That biblical hope has its strength. It is useful. It has its power because of who we put our hope in. Notice that Simeon, he puts his hope in a baby. <laughs> uh, it, it was a baby that couldn't even walk yet. Simeon looks at this baby and he says these words. He says, my eyes have seen your salvation. And this is where Simeon nailed it. You see, when you see Jesus, you see salvation. When you experience Jesus, you experience salvation because that is where it is. When you put your hope in Jesus, you're putting your hope for your salvation. And this is why we can hope today, because of Jesus, because of that baby, that special guest that Simeon invited in. The invitation is for us 
to invite that guest in and then share him with the world. See, biblical hope is that abiding desire, confident expectation, and spirit-led effort to see the kingdom of Jesus be a blessing to the world. Now, to be clear, hope is not just God can. It's not just that God could or that God might. It's that God will. And, and we can be confident that God will because he did in Jesus. And so it's to Jesus we pray. Lord God, we just, we, we invite you to give us, give us your desire. God, would you give us your expectation and then would you guide us by the power of your spirit into what you would have for us? Oh Lord, please guide us into being a blessing to the world. In Jesus' name.